you good morning. We're in Colossians today, chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. If you did not bring a Bible with you, uh, there's one on the floor under a chair, either your chair or the one next to you, one of those blue Bibles. If you pick that one up, it's on page 573. And that Bible is yours. If you don't have one, please take that home with you. Uh, I'm Andrew, and I serve with Anthony, overseeing the Redemption Communities. Uh, we host an RC as well, and also serve Saturday mornings at the Men's Bible Study. So if you have any questions about RC or Men's Bible Study, I'll be out front at the end of service. Happy to speak with you. But we've got Colossians 3, 20 and 21. It says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. This is God's word. You may be seated. Thank you, Andrew. I see a lot of young people in here. Sorry you're here for this message. <laughs> Brutal. Uh, speaking of young people, Chandler Cruz is our worship director. He's amazing. He's talented. He's a sweet friend. I've known him for a long time. I love him. I love his wife. But uh, Chandler just celebrated one year working anniversary full time. So... Uh, <laughs> The reason I say that is uh, he's sort of what I think God put me on this earth to do, is to be around the next generation of church leaders and pastors and just really pour into them. And it's so easy with Chandler. He is amazingly gifted. Uh, he's sweet. He's humble. I, he just went off to that camp, and I talked to some people who got to interact with him. So he's leading the worship band. He used to lead a GCU uh, worship, was super talented there. But out of camp, this guy said he was by far the most talented musician on the stage, and he was the most humble. And I never meet young guys especially whose character outpaces their talent, and that's what you have in Chandler. And he just said, I don't know how you got him, but you are so lucky. So Chandler, welcome uh, to one year anniversary. You get no pay raise. You are... <laughs> but dude, I love you. I think you have a... Everyone knows you have a bright future, but your character is on display, so I appreciate you, brother. Uh, that being said, we get to talk about parenting and raising our own kids or stepkids or uh, however this house uh, breaks down for you. We get to talk about parenting. My wife would say that the de desire to have a big family, we have four sons, uh, came after watching this movie while you were sleeping. Sandra Bullock, it's back when rom-coms were great and clean and you could watch them with the whole family. But there's this scene where they're all around the table, they're all talking over each other, and she's like, that's what I want for my future. I want that, I want that sort of crazy loud family. And she's like, that is not at all what I want now that I have it. But that's what she <laughs> wanted. I want that. Let's move to that. Now, Christians in the room. Not everybody's a Christian. Just because you come to church, I get people get invited. If, in Christian parents specifically, in Christian kids. What's our desire? It's more than just a quantity in our house. It's a quality. What are we hoping for as we think about our homes? Here's the word I want to, Christ-centered homes. How do we have Christ-centered homes? Now, here's what I'm very cognizant of. I've spent the last 12 years in ministry, specifically in family ministry, helping parents, a lot of teenagers, all that sort of stuff. And Christian parenting can go so goofy so quickly because the Bible gives us very solid principles. And it sort of sets us on a direction for what this should feel like. But then Christians oftentimes will step in and say, oh, and this, and this, and this. If your home doesn't look like this, then you are not raising kids God's way. You need to do it God's way. Like, th there are clear principles, which we're going to see here, but there's also the, all this freedom to sort of live out what a Christ-centered home f looks like. What I want to do this morning is the best of my ability. Paul does not say much here. He's pretty quick. Children, parents, specific, specifically fathers, and then dips out and moves on to the next thing. And he pray, and this is his hope. Children obey, fathers don't provoke your kids. There's not a lot there. But just pulling from this passage, I have five, I think, values, priorities of a home that wants to be Christ-centered. So that's what I want to do is, in this little passage, pull out five values that I think Paul gives us by the Holy Spirit and pray that we walk out of here more encouraged, more hopeful, and more dependent on the Lord to have a Christ-centered home. So would you bow your heads and pray with me as we ask God to be here? Father, thank you for the home. Thank you for being our father. Thank you for creating an eternal home that we get to experience with you forever. And God, thank you even for the gift of the homes we have now, which are finite and led by sinful people. 
Yet even in their sinfulness and brokenness and short-sightedness, they offer glimpses, sometimes very large glimpses and pictures of what it's going to feel like to spend eternity with you. So God, help us to draw close to you through your word this morning. Specifically, I pray for the children and the fathers and the mothers in here, that you would speak to us directly. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen. So five values. Here's the first one. If you're a note taker, the eyes of God. A Christ-centered home should prioritize the eyes of God. What do I mean by that? A Christ-centered home sees and values everyone in the home. So what Andrew just read, I'm just going to read again just to get us in the word. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children. That's the end of the passage for today. Nothing about what is said right there leads me to that. It's the context of what we're reading. We are in this book of Colossians. It was a letter written over 2,000 years ago by a guy named Paul and sent to a little city called Colossae in modern-day Turkey. And it was sent to this little fledgling church just getting started, like 40 people or so, 50 people, they think, very small church. Hey, here's a letter from one of the godfathers of the faith, one of the first New Testament apostles. Here is a letter for wisdom and how to do life. And it's written into a specific cultural context, which we talked about the last few weeks. There's a Greco-Roman way to do life. And here's what's fascinating. Here's how it should have went down based off how life worked for Rome. Paul, a male leader writing a letter, should have given it to another male leader, which he did. But the male leader should have been the only one addressed because that's all that really matters in a patriarchal society is the, the father. So growing up, like I had friends, dads that I could tell were like, man, that guy's... A little chauvinistic. That guy's a lot chauvin. That guy's intense. And the way like I would watch as I'm just watching him do life is the men that were equals to them got the respect. Their male sons got a little less respect. Their wives were sort of pushed to the side and women around them were just kind of, that's the culture that Paul's writing into. So he could have wrote a letter and basically wrote these instructions specifically to the men. And he would have said, men, here's what I want. Make sure you lead your wives well. Men, as you parent, make sure your kids obey you. And men, as you go and work and have bond servants and slaves, make sure you're treating them like God will want you to be treated. And that would have been perfectly acceptable to just address the men. But he doesn't. Last week, he's first people group he addresses, wives. It's like God is saying, I don't need to speak through a man to speak to the women in my churches. They have a direct relationship with me. Wives, here's your marching orders. Husbands, here's your marching orders. Now here, children, here's your marching orders. And parents, here's your marching orders. Slaves, bond servants. It's, it's mind-boggling. That didn't happen anywhere. The only reason that happened is because a Christian, the Apostle Paul, wrote it that way. So as we think about the day we live in, where we're all about progress and human rights, all the stuff I'm pro, pro, pro. Too often we live in a world that says Christianity is getting in the way of that. We need to get Christianity out of the way so people can have rights and every people group can have rights. People tend to forget that rights only came because Christians stepped into society in significant ways and changed the way people were viewed. And in this letter, we get a glimpse of it. Children, listen up. God has a word for you. That would not happen in any other Roman context in the day except for the local church. What do we learn from that? God sees every single individual, marginalized, women, whatever ethnic minority, whatever handicap, whatever disability, whatever walk of life you're in, God sees you and knows you. And as he speaks into the home environment, he wants homes to be shaped by that ethos, that feel, that everyone gets seen, everyone is known. It's not dads and then all those other minions. It's children. Hey, the Lord has a word for you. Do it this way. What do I take from that just as a dad, as a pastor over some dads and moms and stepdads and stepmoms? Here's what we need to remember. We need to see our kids as unique. They are made by a creator who made one of them. One. I was watching all these, like, what's the best sermon on parenting you've ever seen? One guy had a two-part sermon, and, basically, and I loved it. Here's what you need to do as a Father's Day message. Fathers, you need to know and celebrate the uniqueness of your kids, each of them, and you need to encourage them, encourage them, encourage them. 
encourage him. He says, no kid walks around full of courage and fulfillment. That's a dad's job, to see their uniqueness, speak to it, and to encourage, encourage, encourage. Everybody gets seen in a Christ-centered home. Nobody is disregarded. Psalm 139, I want to read this, just part of it, just to remind us of how our kids were made. Those of us that are lucky enough to have children given to us by God. Here's what Apostle Paul, or not Apostle Paul, King David says in Psalm 139. It's his famous verse. It's a great parenting message to just read over and over again. David says this, For you formed, he's speaking about God, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was not one. How precious This might be the best line in the whole Bible. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, I would, but I can't. That's how each child was made, me included, and the four kids God has given me to raise, and whatever kids you potentially have in this room with you. How vast are the thoughts of God for your children? And our job as parents is to try to cultivate that spirit within us, which does not come as natural to a perfectly good, heavenly creator. They're all unique, uniquely made by God. So after each of these, I just want to leave a question for parents to kind of sit with. Here's the question for this. Is do you know and celebrate the uniqueness of each family member? And I get it. It's hard. But I think that's what God wants for us, first and foremost, as a Christ-centered family, to see and to know each of the individuals that God has blessed us with. Do you know and celebrate the uniqueness of each family member? That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. It's more than just God wants us to have full self-esteem given by him, but we're not just self-esteem factories where we want to puff up our kids. We have a direction. We have a calling on our life. Here's the second thing we see in this actual verse is the direction of God. A Christ-centered home has clear authority, both heavenly and earthly. Where do I see that? It's right out of the gate. Verse 20, what does Paul tell the church at Colossae and tell us? Children. Again, he's speaking directly to the children, not through a dad, but to the kids in this room. Those of you who live with your parents still, listen. Let me tell you what God wants for you. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Kids, what are you supposed to obey your parents in? Everything. Kids, oh, and elder, one more time. Everything. There it is. <laughs> Children, obey your parents in everything, because there's a heavenly authority and there's an earthly authority. Because now we live in this world where there's sort of like this child-centered movement where it's like the kids are the center and you kind of navigate life based off what's best for the kids. And it's like, I don't think that's the way God set this up. You should love and care and adore and treasure and protect. But you are on the move. You are being moved in a direction that the Heavenly Father in Heaven has taken you and you're supposed to take your kids with you. And the direction is this. It's obedience in everything. Now, last week it was husbands and wives. Husbands love, wives submit. This week is children obey. What's the difference between submit and obey? Because there's very big differences. The wives do not have the same call as the children. Submit is this. It's when one person has a complete right to an opinion and to share it and to speak it, but from time to time has to yield their opinion to another's. So that was the call last week for Christian marriage. This week for children in the room, here's what obedience is. Is when, write this down, tattoo it on your arm. Is when one's opinion does not matter. (laughs) The person matters, their thoughts, their feelings matter, but their opinion about where we're going to eat ultimately doesn't matter. What church I'm going to take my family to be a member of. We live in this world where it's like, well, what's going to ease the tension of all these kids? The answer is nothing, ultimately. A father and a mother who leading well will help. 
The children are called to obey in everything. So like certain cultures, we live in this kind of, everything gets grayed out. Like Jewish culture, you'd be 0 to 13, and then 13 you start to turn, and the obedience shifts. And you no longer have to obey your mother the same way. We just, everything's blended together here. But whatever it is for you, whatever age it is for you, child and parent, before you get to the age where you're an adult and you're doing your thing, your call is to obey in everything. I think if I was to break down uh, the just parenting years again, just full disclosure, I'm the oldest is 12 in my house. So I've got a lot more to learn and walk through. But as I've walked with a lot of families, a lot of families with teens and college age kids, here's how I'd break down parenting kids, your child years, your children years. Here's what it's for. It's learning how to listen to one voice and to follow it. That voice is your parents' voice, your father's voice, your mother's voice, your stepfather's voice, your authority in your house. God has given you a testing ground to figure out how to listen to a voice and follow it. Like Anthony talks about VBS and why it's important. We got all these hooks coming at us because the next stage, the teen years, here's how I describe the teen years, is learning how to hear lots of voices and still follow one voice, which is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. That's why the teen years are rough. One of the reasons is you have all these voices coming at you. Your own even gets louder inside of you. And you're still, like, what is the voice of God telling me? The child years is for kids to learn how to hear a voice and follow it. And then the adult years is learning how to listen to that one voice still in the midst of all these voices and then helping the next generation to do the same. We're all in the same boat. We're all trying to hear the one voice, the voice of truth and life and goodness and beauty and follow that. The kid years are specifically, the training ground is listen to your parents, obey them. In what? In everything. Now, kids, here's the blessing is you are not alone. This verse here, children, obey your parents in everything is not unique to being a kid, being a young person in a house. That is the call of discipleship. Jesus came and lived on this earth. He was this rabbi that people began to follow, proved himself to be the Messiah, the chosen one of God. He goes to a cross. He's killed on a Roman cross, placed in a grave, comes out of his own grave three days later, spends some more time with the disciples, setting them on mission. And here's what he says is the mission of following Jesus. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Give them a new identity as followers of me. But then more than that, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What is discipleship? It is learning how to obey Jesus in everything. What is being a child? It's learning how to obey your parents in everything. What is the difference between them? Nothing really. It's the same, different context. Learning how to obey, learning how to obey. Discipleship and parenting is synonymous. So a parent who postures themselves as a way not being in discipleship is not helping their cause as they're trying to teach their kids to obey. That's a lot of the friction we get in homes. Kids, I tell you this, keep it as simple as possible. Like, this is coming from a guy who caused a lot of issues for his parents, but the Bible doesn't give you a lot of words to think about. What's, it gives you sort of two. Obey your parents. You're like, I get it. Move on to point number three obey, and the Ten Commandments, the fifth rule, right smack dab in the middle. The first four are how do you love God? The last ones are how do you love people? And right smack dab in the middle is what's the th- in the middle is the thing that's going to keep those in your life. It's honor your father and mother. And in so doing, you will live long in the land. So as God looks at you in the younger years, honor and obey. And parents, I'd tell you the same thing. Keep it simple. Like how many rules do you have your kids God tells them to honor and obey. Keep it simple. Obedience is hard enough. We don't need to add so much to it. I keep it simple. Another thing for parents, especially guys in this room, um, in all my life, I spend a lot of time in counseling rooms with family brokenness. And it's usually the father who is sort of tone deaf. It's like, the issue is this, it's obedience. My kid's not obeying me. She's not living. And you kind of like get below the layers. It's like, you are so, what's the, here's the thing I don't see a lot of dads naturally doing is thinking, what's the environment I've created for my kid to have to learn how to obey in? It's like, just goes right over. It's like, no, their job is to obey. I get that. 
But have you created an environment where it's easy to learn? The best book I've read in the last few months is this, the other half of the church, and it's about brain activity and all this smart stuff. But essentially saying churches for too long have fo focused on content and truth, teaching people the right things to think about God, which is important. And they've neglected what is a helpful learning environment for people. And the four things that are necessary for anybody to learn in an ongoing, consistent way, the first thing is not what you'd expect. It is a joyful environment. How joyful is your home environment? The second thing they called hesed love. It's the Old Testament word for covenant love. They use the word attachment. All this attachment theory people have, they say the kids actually need to feel attached to you. Not in a conditional sense like it's going to be broken if they fail, but they are attached to you. You are for them no matter what. Is your home joyful? Is there like a strong attachment there? The third one is, there, is there a group identity? Does it feel like the Watts are a group? Like we're in this together? Or does it feel like, Dad, kids, are we on group mission together? And then the final one is, is there a pattern of healthy correction? Which is what dads try to jump to. Let's correct this. Well, how joyful is the house? I didn't come here to talk about joy. I came here to talk about her. Well, you're never going to really get to her unless you start with these other things. So that takes me to that. Here's the question in this stage. Do you know the season of parenting you're in? Is that the one? Yes, that's the one. Oh. As you think about your child years, are you in an authority phase? Like here's, I've prayed a lot. I asked a lot of people, what would you say if you were up here to teach a parenting message? I asked my kids, and they said, well, tell them to have a pool because it helps. I'm like, all right, so <laughs> have a pool. And they'd say, my Jude said, don't take away Fortnite. So don't do what I did. Don't take away Fortnite. I would just tell you this. Like, know what season you're in. Are you aware of the season of life you're in? Children, your job is to learn how to obey. If you have little kids, like my oldest is 12. If you're before, younger than me and your families, your job is to be the authority, even if that's not fun. It's to drill that in. If you have teens and adolescents, your job is to draw out what's in them and to influence them in a more nuanced, creative, authority sort of way. And if you have adult kids, your job is still to influence them and love them the best you can. What season of life are you in right now? Here's the next thing, the smile of God. I love this. What does Paul tell you kids in this room? Verse 20, obey your parents. Paul, why should I obey my parents? You tell me. And he says this, for this pleases the Lord. Our third value of a Christ-centered home is this. A Christ-centered home is motivated by pleasing the Lord. Not by appeasing dad's wrath. Not by appeasing mom's anxiety. Not by keeping peace with a bunch of knuckleheads. Children, obey your parents. Why? Because it pleases the Lord. It brings a smile to the face of the Lord. Like so much of life is figuring out who it is you want to please. Your boss, yes, but how much? Your coworkers, your friends, your peers, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. Like I already see the kids in, me, in my house that like think about people pleasing too much and where it potentially could take them. Who are you pleasing? Children, obey your parents for it is pleasing to the Lord. Like, think about this. You have choices to make between now and when you go to bed tonight on how you're going to obey your parents. And Paul says you can please God. You can bring a smile to God's face by obeying Owen Elder, Elijah Watt, and others in this room. But here's where you have to be so clear as a Christian if you want to be faithful to the Scriptures. Is your standing before God does not depend or rest or stand on your ability to obey God. The gospel says this, if you receive by faith Jesus Christ, you get his perfect righteousness, and all of your disobedience is forgiven, and all of his obedience is given to you as a gift. The picture in the New Testament, if you look at the book of Revelation at the very end, we start off naked, you go to the end of the Bible, and we're clothed, we're clothed in white robes, which is a picture of righteousness that someone else had to put on us. So if you are seven, if you are 10, if you're 15, or you're 16, the gospel is this, all of your disobedience can be covered covered by Jesus perfect righteousness right now so he is 100% satisfied with you if your faith is in the finished work of Jesus 
That being said, you're standing now with clothes given to you by Christ. You can still please your Father in heaven or displease your Father in heaven, not in a way where he backs away from you, but the countenance on his face can be changed by your actions and how you live this verse out, by obeying your Father in heaven. That's a good word. Here's the next thing we see is the smile of God. A Christ, oh no, that's where we were just at, my bad. The correction of God. A Christ at our home prioritizes parental discipleship as much as a child's training. So this, I think, is the homes that get this, and I'll speak to you dads right now, the ability for you to take this home and to really, like, internalize this is the extent to which your home will feel Christ-centered or not. It'll feel hip hypocritical it'll feel judgy it'll feel a lot of different things but if a parent does not put this in their heart and believe it with all their might a home is not going to feel christ-centered what do i mean by that a parent's role is to be discipled by jesus first and foremost out of that relationship a parent's job is to then teach their kid to obey where do i see that verse 21 paul turns his attention to the fathers here and he's not kind. He does not mince words. He just goes straight to it. He says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Provoke means to stir up to the point of frustration. And discouraged means to lose heart. Fathers, don't provoke, don't stir up to the point of frustration to where your kids begin to lose heart and shrunk and shoulders down in terms of how they feel about themselves and the world. It's interesting, just fathers, if you flip over to Ephesians, it says this. Children, obey your parents. The word for parents, father and mother. And then two verses down. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. So it seems like the Bible would place this warning solely on the heads of the fathers in this room. Which we'd be like, I don't know if I agree with that. My wife, she provokes my kids too. Yeah, so wives, you can listen to this. and Stepmoms and moms. But dads, don't miss out on the fact that as the Bible addresses you, it's filled with warnings of how your personality and my personality hurts the ability for a home to be Christ-centered. Like, that's a heavy weight to, like, and again, you're, if, only if you're a Christian, only if you have the Holy Spirit does it even hit you. So just thank God that it's a gift that you're even hearing this right now. Yeah. It's hitting you. That's a gift. Most dads, it's like, the issue is this, this, this. No, Christian dads, the issue is don't provoke your kids to anger. Don't stir them up. Don't annoy them. Does that happen? A hundred percent. All day, every day. With a dad who is engaged in the home, it happens. But just with fatherhood in general, this is the curse of fatherhood. Is it's this big potential for blessing in this world. But the idea of fatherhood is this huge gap of just pain and frustration and miss when it comes to what God desires for the home. Like just a few stats, just to kind of, I mean, we all know this. There are 72 million fathers in the United States right now. 33% of all children live in a home without their birth father. 72% of Americans think an absent father in the household is the most pressing issue we need to push into. So it's not like Paul's saying something random that we have to do some work to figure out. He's like, yeah, he's onto something. In 1960, only 9% lived with a single parent. By 2012, so 10 years ago, it got up to 20%. It's up by another 8% now. So it's like not trending well. The percentage of minors in prison who grew up without a father is 85%. The percentage of adolescents in substance abuse treatment facilities from fatherless homes is 75%. 71% of teenagers who are pregnant come from a father's home. 63% of youth suicides happen in households with an absent father. And 85% of children with behavioral disorders are from homes without fathers. Like, the Bible doesn't have to tell us that fatherhood matters. Stats tell us that. The Bible tells us this, that fatherhood matters to the father for him to do the heart work to be fully what God designed him to be. We can read any stat and just say, yeah, fatherhood matters. Christianity provides this unique insight where it's like a mere place before a father that he can't get around. It's like, oh, I got to do this work. I got to do this work. My favorite, but I have some books up here I'll mention. My favorite parenting book of all time is a very short book. It's kind of artistic. And Eugene Peterson's his pastor. He wrote all these amazing books. He wrote the message, paraphrase of the Bible. But this is his book for parents of teens. 
And is essentially his point is, parents of teens, God is working on you right now. Don't miss it. Here's some quotes from this book. My purpose in writing this book is to block any approach that reduces adolescence to a problem that must be solved and insists that it's an experience to be entered into by the middle age as well as by the young. I love that. You've been invited in in this middle age to what? As a means for growing up. That's to the parent. But there's a difference. The young are forced to go through this by nurture, virtue of their biology. They're just on a train that's driving itself. Parents, the middle age, willingly must embrace this by virtue of their faith or willfully refuse in their unbelief. See, he's like, you get invited into letting these passages, Colossians 3.21, hit you, and you kind of have to do the work. He summarizes his whole book, adolescence is a gift, God's gift to the parent in middle age when the juices of life dry up. God then brings into our lives a challenge to grow, testing our love, chastening our hope, pushing our faith, demanding response and requiring participation. Who is parenting for? It's for the parent just as much as it is for the child. And God's inviting you in to sort of this self-reflection and do the hard work of figuring out, how am I provoking my children to anger? Like I Googled a bunch, how do you provoke a child to anger? How do fathers do this? And there's a million blogs that give you 46 ways. Here's what I encourage you to do, is write your own blog for you personally if you're a father. How do I provoke my children to anger? How do I stir them up? How do I lo make them lose heart, sort of deflate their balloon? I wrote a list for me. Again, this is unique to me, but just to give you an idea. In my own house, here's how Josh Watt does this. This is not exhaustive. This is just what I came up with. I see projects over people all the time. Like I've got six people in the house. Four of them I'm training on how to do work and to do chores. And I see all these chores that need to be done all the time. And I'm always like, let's go. And they're like running like, all right, dad's in a mood. It's like, I don't see them. I don't see their eye color. I don't see their hair. I just see a blob of workers like, all right, let's get on the same page and let's go clean the backyard. Part of it's like I want to raise men, but part of it's I prioritize projects over people too often, provoking my kids into anger. I'm not telling you, well, don't do chores. No, absolutely do chores. <laughs> Another way is I use all my creative juices up at work. Like men... I don't know that's not an amen, but that's in your heart, amen that, because that's manhood 101. Is you spend all this time and energy doing the thing that's paying you the bills to have the life you have, and you come home, and you drink a Coors Light, and you watch TV, and you reset that way. Your creative juices should not all be spent on work. It should be spent on your children, and I do that all the time. Like I, the Holy Spirit, it's one of the most convicting things he does, is from time to time, he just kind of snaps his fingers, and it's like a way to say, like, When's the last time I creatively thought about anything for my kids? It's not, it's not mom's job to do all that. I'm a part of that too. Not giving space for their creative uniqueness to come out. I've got a blob of kids, all dudes. It's like I could just see just a blob of dude. Or I could see, how's that dude a little different than that dude? How is that dude? It's, some of you have like both genders and you get, you're further ahead than I am. I just have the one gender I'm trying to figure out. Here's the biggest one I've noticed with, as they get older in school is I don't understand their world that I don't get to see. Like, what does it feel like to walk the halls of school? And again, we're going to do our best to understand, but even attempting to be like, what's it like to walk from here to here, to walk home after school, to be in this class with that kid that he always talks about that I kind of listen to his stories, but they just drag on forever. So I need, what does it feel like to be him, to be her, in their private life that I don't ever see. When I don't do that, I'm provoking my kids. I'm stirring them up. I'm doing exactly what Paul warns against. And then the big one that all of us struggle with, not saying sorry and asking for forgiveness. Like, I just don't do it enough. I screw up this much. I ask for apologies this much. It's, again, and this is not to, like, lower the bar so low that we're like, you know what, we all are terrible. No, it's just to be honest with where each of us are at and trying to let the scriptures speak into our life so that we can live these out more. Now, here's the better question for Christians. How you provoke, I think you need to spend some time, but why you are that way. Like, as you pull weeds, you want the root to come out. Just think about the things you do that mess up with your kids. That's like pulling off the top and leaving the root. What's the root going on underneath there? 
Like, have you spent some time thinking about why you are the way you are as a father? Because the New Testament warns you and challenges you to think about your fatherhood and how it's affecting your kids. So I wrote some questions just to help us think through fatherhood. Have you done some work on your family of origin? Like therapy, perhaps. I'm a fan, I'm pro, but I don't think you have to. But you got to do some work and figure out. One book I just read, Intentional Father, such a good book. He starts off, it's about kind of raising your kids through the teen years. The very first thing you have to do is write a letter to your father just telling him what it was like to be his son. For some, it's like, great. For me, it's like, dad, you were the breast. For a lot of people I know, dad, you hurt me this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. But have you done some work? Number two, on a scale of one to ten, how self-aware are you? This is just in the counseling room and all the situations I've been in helping families. The dad is usually the least self-aware person in the room. He might have the most money, the most success in work. He might have impress a lot of impressive people out there. But you get him in a room where you got to self-reflect and it's like, you're like a kindergartner. Have you done some work to like be self-aware? Again, we're all growing. We all need grace. Third one, how are you dreaming for your kids? Like Christianity is more than just, I want my kids to be obedient. It's, we get to dream. Psalm 139, God, why did you create my kids? I want to dream towards their future and pray towards their future and save and invest towards their future. How are you dreaming for your kids and fostering not just the negative warnings that God gives you, but the positive, like, what could be? And then fourth, what do you currently use to cope with the pain and frustration in life? Like, not like major pain where you need medication or depression or panic attacks or migraines. Like baseline parenting. I was just in San Diego for vacation and it was fascinating. I'm running on the beach, Ocean Beach, San Diego area, and every single person, no exaggeration. Preachers exaggerate all the time. This is the one time I'm telling you this is exactly what it was. <laughs> every single person is standing on the beach on the cliffs at Point Loma smoking weed and looking at the beach. And you're like, hey, I smoke weed. What's wrong with that? Again, we can talk about medical reasons and all that. I'm talking about baseline parenting, like the frustrations that come with trying to raise humans. If you have to use stuff to cope, like all the time, I think Scripture would tell you to stop and think about, because you're never going to do the hard work to figure out what it is that's in you that's getting all stirred up and stirring up your kids and provoking them to anger, because you just tap out. And look at the beach and enjoy a puff or enjoy a drink. <sighs> and then try to go back into life. And next time something gets stirred up, you check out. Like that's something in here, in our church already. Like is it drinking? What? Just answer that question honestly. I'm not asking you to post it and send it to a, or tell the elders or even come and tell me. But just do the heart work of like what am I coping with? For the sake of you and your own health and your family's health. And for your relationship with Jesus. What are you using to cope? So here's the question I have for us. How healthy is your home right now? If you, whatever you want to do to gauge that. Fathers especially, stepfathers, think about that. And then here's the thing you need to dive into. What is God teaching you right now in this season of parenting? Like what's he teaching me as I have kids enter adolescence? I'll deal with the kid stuff and what I need to do with them, but I don't want to miss out on the fact that God is training me right now in the season two. And he's training you, parents. What's he teaching you, those of you who have infants? He's teaching me that I'm selfish and I've had a really good life up to this point. Like, no issues. <laughs> no good. Praise God and thank God. What's he teaching you right now? And then finally, the fifth value of a Christ-centered home is this. A Christ-centered home needs the grace of God. A Christ-centered home knows that each member needs a great and personal high priest. Kids don't need grace more than parents. Parents need grace just as much as kids. We all need grace. Eugene Peterson, in that same book, here's what he talks about with relationships. In Scripture, you won't find a good family in the Bible. There are no exemplary families. There are no perfect families in our church, but there's a series of broken relationships in need of redemption. That's what a home is. 
What is there is a promise of new community with the experiences of life as the household of faith, a family in Christ. What does a family in Christ feel like? Life together consists of relationships that are created not by blood, although that's a big part of it, biological kids and foster kids and adopted kids, at least not by your blood, but it's created by grace. What is a Christ-centered home at its core? We get along not because we are good, but because we are forgiven. And sinners in the room said, amen. And sinful fathers in the room said, amen. And sinful children said, amen. What we need is grace. We need Jesus' perfection to cover our imperfection. We need, by faith, to trust him so that his righteousness would cover us. And we need to be reminded over and over and over again that what we need is grace. A great high priest. Children, you are to obey your parents and everything. You will not do that perfectly the rest of the day. The rest of the week. Fathers, you are told to not provoke your kids to anger. You will make one of your kids angry because of your sin before tonight ends. That is humanity. What we need is not perfection. We need grace. We need the perfect high priest. How is Jesus described in Hebrews? This is what Jesus described as. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. We don't have a priest who is unable to sympathize with what it's like to be a kid being raised by sinners. Mary and Joseph sinned against Jesus all the time. He perfectly obeyed two sinful parents every opportunity he get. But in one and in every respect, he's been tempted just like us. He's been tempted, fathers like us, to provoke others to anger. And he never once did. Why? Because he is the perfect high priest. What does your home need at the center? It needs Jesus and his grace. Amen? What a gift we have to have homes that God's given us. We want to press even more into what it looks like to be a Christ-centered home. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the gift of raising kids that not all of us get to fully experience like we hope or dream. And even those of us who have kids and stepkids and adopted kids and foster kids, It's always a lot harder and more difficult than we expect. But God, thank you for Christianity and the word of God that gives light to what is happening. We're not being punished. We're not being taken through the ringer. We're not being tested to earn some eternal salvation. We're be invited into a process of learning what it looks like to follow Jesus, whether we're children, whether we're parents, whether a father who has no earthly model of what this looks like. We have been invited in to learn how to obey you. And as parents, we've been invited to learn how to love others like you've loved us. So God, what a beautiful invitation to be a part of the family of God and to be fathers and mothers in homes that are desiring to be Christ-centered. So God, help us in our homes. In all the areas that were brought up today by your spirit, I pray that you would uh, not relent, that you would continue to push, push into the fathers and mothers and children in the room in the areas where we need to be pushed into so that we might be more Christ-centered than we are even today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.